I'm always glad to talk about my favorite place, <laughs> which is Newfoundland. I'm going to ask a question I hadn't planned on. I've been looking at this crowd. I think it would be interesting. How many of you have been to Newfoundland? Look at that. Yeah. How, many there? How, how many have lived there? Yes, I know. So if I make some mistakes, there will be people to correct me. My wife Florence and I began our marriage in Newfoundland 52, 53 years ago, 1969 to 71. We were elementary teachers. And that was a period of time when Newfoundland was unable to provide all of its own teachers and nurses. So organizations like Mennonite Central Committee that sent us uh, placed teachers and nurses where nobody else wanted to go, usually the most out of the way uh, little outports. When our sons were an appropriate age, we took them to see Newfoundland in 1983, and we were back in the years that you see there five more times, and Friday we're leaving again, <laughs> and we're very excited about it. Uh, COVID kept us from going the last two years. So we're glad to be going back to our favorite place. Pronunciation, you gotta get this right, folks. Nobody mm. in the United States pronounces it correctly. It's Newfoundland, not Newfoundland. There's no Lund. <laughs> uh, it, it rhymes with understand. Understand Newfoundland, understand Newfoundland. You can say Newfoundland too. You can put the accent on the new as long as you say land. It's a land, not a Lund. This is the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. It's a two-part province, entered Canada in 1949, or as the Newfies say, that's when Canada joined us. Mm -hmm. The biggest part geographically is Labrador, uh, very sparsely populated. And then there's the island of Newfoundland where most of its, most of its people live. And uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, if you look at the coastline and see all the little inlets, all the little islands, which you can only see a fraction of them on a map like this, there are 10,000 miles of coastline in Newfoundland and Labrador, which is one of the things that makes it a photographer's paradise. Just every place along the coastline, there's, there's a photograph. The whole province has a bit over a half a million people very sparsely populated. 6% uh, of them are in Labrador, and the rest are in the island of Newfoundland. And two out of five Newfoundlanders live in the little red circle that you see down in the lower right. That's the capital of St. John's and the surrounding uh, suburbs and, and communities. So that's very heavily populated. And more than half, 52-53% uh, of all Newfoundlanders live on the Avalon Peninsula, which is the area that I circled in green to the lower right. So that is very heavily populated. If you want to buy real estate there, it's very, very high. Um, the interior of the island, um, not much except bogs and moose. Um, the action is around the coastline. It's the coastline that makes the province. When my wife and I were there, we lived on New World Island. I have that circled in red, also circled there to the north of New World Island is Twillingate Island. That was sort of our home. That whole area there is called Notre Dame Bay. This is a little closer up view of where we lived. We lived in a little town, Virgin Arm. And again, it's a very uh, complicated area geographically, a lot of islands, um, very complicated coastline. Uh, we'll be going again there this summer, and Florence and I are going to be spending two weeks on Fogo <coughs> Island, which is this island right here. It's just a lovely, lovely place. So photos from 50, 52 years ago um, prove that we were there then. That's our little Volkswagen bug. Um, before this causeway was built, that you see here, the only access to the area where we lived was by boat. So this causeway was a huge, huge development uh, for the people of New World Island. And you could finally drive from our island to the rest of Newfoundland. And it was a, uh, just a brand new thing to be, able to, to be able to do that. We sort of took it for granted that it was quite new for them. 
On the upper left is the little one room schoolhouse where I taught seventh grade the first year. And on the lower right is the three room schoolhouse where my wife taught first grade that first year, uh, two different locations. Before this year, all the schools were parochial schools. Uh, the United Church, Salvation Army, uh, Pentecostal, Catholic, they all had their own little one room schools, sometimes right across the road from each other. In 1969, when we got there, was the first year that Newfoundland had a public school system, a provincial school system. It was the first time that all kids from one grade were in one room. All the teachers had all eight grades in one room, and they didn't know what to do with a room full of fifth graders all day. So we did, and we helped explain that uh, to other teachers. Um, this is the facility behind Florence's school, a three-holer. Um, we think that's where she caught infectious hepatitis, and she was not feeling well really the whole two years we were there. And in spite of that difficulty, we, we fell in love with the place. There was a, an epidemic on the island, and she got it. These are my very well-behaved seventh graders at their Christmas party in my little one-room school. Uh, these kids are now 65 years old, and I am Facebook friends with three of them in that picture. So it's, it's been sort of fun to, uh, to keep up with them. That handsome young man was me when I was a little younger, learning how to run a wood stove. We had an outhouse, we had a wood stove, we didn't have electricity, we didn't have any running water. Um, I smoked up the house several times trying to learn how to run the stove. Um, got the hang of it after a while. Uh, had to go down to a spring and with a bucket to get our water. We didn't have running water. One time we got snowed in, I couldn't get to the spring. So I got some nice clean snow and I was melting it on the stove. And of course I got about a quarter of an inch of snow of water out of that. The house was wired for electricity, but we couldn't get it hooked up for a couple months. So I had the experience of studying by lamplight. And uh, my eyes got red after a couple hours of studying every night. Um, but it was sort of interesting to experience what my forefathers would have experienced. Now, this, this local house illustrates several things about houses in, at least in our part of Newfoundland, um, during the time that we were there. Number one, they love bright colors. That's still true today, but you don't see this quite as much for several reasons. So their bright colors are common. You'll notice that the house is built up on stilts. That's because you're always building on rock. In Newfoundland, it's either bog, which you can't build on, or rock. So there are no basements in Newfoundland. I, I don't know if any, maybe there's one somewhere. Uh, but you have to build up on stilts. And then if you have enough money to finish the job, you put a skirt around it. These people didn't have enough money to finish the job. This also illustrates the fact that there was a lot of poverty during that time. We had quite a few people who really didn't have much money. Um, the other thing about this house is you notice the front door has no steps leading to it. The majority of the houses had a front door exactly like this. You never used the front door. You always used the, the back door and the side door. It was there, but never used. Very, very, very common. <laughs> this is one of my favorite paint jobs. Um, <laughs> You'll notice the OSHA approved scaffolding. <laughs> yeah. uh, they love bright colors. If you're painting your house, you might want to use this one for inspiration. Um, this is very nicely and carefully done. But again, it illustrates the, the love of bright colors. This is the house that we lived in the first year we were there in Virgin Arm. You can tell it's spring because of the broken sea ice out there in the, in the harbor. This is in Virgin Arm. And um, we had an oil drum there for some oil heat. We put that in later, which was sort of nice, more, a more steady heat than running the stove. And I want to show you what this house looked like in 2004. Same house, same place, same perspective. This happened to almost all the houses in Newfoundland. They discovered white vinyl siding. And I don't blame them. This, the, the wet, damp, salty, air was horrible on paint. And uh, so everything's white vinyl siding. It takes away a lot of the uh, 
the uniqueness of the place, but I don't blame them for doing that. So it's very much upgraded, it's very nice, very modern. Our local library, when a library building project, I'm going to get a model from this. Uh, <laughs> our local bank, built out on the water on stilts. Uh, this was not our outhouse, <laughs> but it was in, not too far away from us and uh, featuring automatic flush as the tide goes in and out. <laughs> All automatic. I, I imagine it might be a little cool to sit there. I never used this one, but that's one of our favorite pictures. Most of the people who are in Newfoundland today have English or Irish roots. And most of those come from the area I circled in red on this map, South East Ireland and Southwest England, fishermen families who ventured across the ocean to get cod. Cod made Newfoundland. And most of the families come from these areas. In some areas, there are Irish Catholic communities and churches. In other areas, there are English Anglican communities. And there are also uh, some other churches, but uh, these are the main areas where the people came from. The, the people in Newfoundland speak English, but if you go there and, 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 and if people aren't speaking to you, knowing you're a tourist, they, they, they're bilingual. When you come there as a tourist, they lapse into correct English. But on their own, you can't even understand them. It's, we couldn't <coughs> understand people at all first. Pretty soon we were talking like they did. Who knit you? Well, who are your parents? Stay where you're to till it comes where you're at. That's a very common one. Mm -hmm. Yes, bye. Bye is boy. I mean, that, that's, you can use that in almost any situation. I just dies at you. Hold me nerves, you got me drove. Lodge it on the bridge. There are no steps, there are no porches in Newfoundland. They're all bridges. So you step out on the bridge, okay? Uh, mosquitoes are nippers and they don't have the TH sound. <coughs> Maybe some of them have learned it, but most Newfoundlanders don't know how to say a TH, so uh, they just say T instead. So you're teaching fractions to a group of seventh graders, and you expect them to say three and a third, and instead they say three and a turn. <laughs> and you try not to laugh, okay? Uh, if a word starts with H, they drop the H. If it starts with a vowel, they add the H. That's a British Cockney uh, influence. So they eat their soup before they eat it. <laughs> that, okay. And you go to hospital to have a operation. They're very consistent about it. Uh, and they don't have the word hurt. You, you find it. I find it's me hellbow. This is a hellbow. Okay. Uh, and they ne never use the word berry. It's always some. Some dirty today. We have, with some dirty today. We had a lot of rain. With some dirty. And they never have to use the word my, it's always me. And again, that's sort of a low class English thing. In 1983, we took our sons to Newfoundland. The highlight of that trip was climbing Grossmorn Mountain. And uh, our younger son was a little bit young for that, but he made it. And it was a gorgeous view. And this is one of the, the memories that our family always cherishes. If you want to go to Newfoundland, you are probably interested in icebergs or seabirds or whales, besides other kinds of uh, photography opportunities. This is a chart that shows the, the prime months for seeing those things. This is now iceberg season. I'm a part of a bunch of Newfoundland Facebook <coughs> iceberg groups, and everybody's just as excited as they can be about this year's icebergs, all kinds of photographs of icebergs. Boat tours going out to see the icebergs, it's, it's a big deal. And the iceberg should hang around through June, maybe into July. The whales and seabirds usually come, uh, it's best, best seen a little bit later. Um, Southern Labrador is to the north, Twillingate is a little bit further south, and then Whitless Bay is to the southeast, further south yet. Icebergs. An iceberg has a two or three year journey before it shows up in Newfoundland waters. 90% of all the icebergs break off of the Greenland glaciers or ice shelves on the west coast of Greenland. 
the current there flows north. So the iceberg, after it breaks off of the glacier, flows north for a long time, and then it takes a left turn to the west, and then it follows the current past Baffin Island, past Labrador, and finally down to the Newfoundland area where tourists love to see them, and eventually they melt. They really don't start melting much until they get down to the area of the island of Newfoundland. And if you go close to one of the icebergs today on a boat tour, it's just dripping um, constantly. This is the story of one particular iceberg you may have heard of. On his two or three year journey, it came down past Newfoundland and it ran into a ship called the Titanic. Um, it's pretty far south for an iceberg and pretty early in the season for an iceberg which is maybe why they weren't expecting it, but there it was. 90% of an iceberg is underwater. You float an ice cube in water and you can see how that works. That's one iceberg there, not three. It's all connected under the water. The sort of green area that you see, uh, that's the ice under the water. Uh, so a lot more underwater than above water, and the part that's below water melts faster than the part up in the up in the air. Uh, they come in all shapes and sizes, and they're constantly changing from one minute to another, from one hour to another, from one day to another. They'll flip over, they founder, they split, they move. Sometimes they get grounded. Sometimes the current takes them away. Uh, it's so it's a constant uh, task to, uh, to keep track of them. Often have that wonderful blue color. And I can't, there's a scientific reason why that's there, but I'm not sure what it is. Sometimes spectacular things like a, an arch and a hole. That's a huge iceberg. <laughs> Small one in a, in a harbor. If you're lucky and if you're patient, you can have your camera ready when one founders. That means it splits apart or part of it falls over. When we were staying in a house right next to this area, sometimes um, at night or early in the morning or late in the evening when it was dark, we'd hear thunder. It wasn't thunder. It was an iceberg splitting. It was a wonderful sound. Now I'm gonna show you a short, very amateur video of a small iceberg foundering. It's about as big as a pickup truck. And I had my eye on it. And I had my camera ready. And this is what happens when an iceberg founders. Now imagine that happening to an iceberg as big as this building. It could be quite spectacular. And when you see an iceberg with foam around it and little pieces of ice around it, you know that it has just foundered. Um, so that's sort of a, a picture of a, of a small one uh, of what happens. Again, they melt, melt faster in the water side, so they get top heavy. Yeah, and then they, they, need to, they need to flip around. Oops, go back. These are two houses that you can rent on Fogo Island. Uh, four years ago, we stayed in the one on the left, which is called Grandma Lily's. And this summer, we're going to spend two weeks in the one on the right, which is called Aunt Gladys. And right out the window, that's the view from inside the house. Wouldn't you like to stay there for two weeks? Uh, the old salt box people, you might want to Google that if you ever want to go to Newfoundland. They have houses like this all over Newfoundland, and they, they move them to spots like this. They move the whole house, they renovate it, they keep as much old stuff as they can, like the floor is original, and then they renovate it, make it all modern, and they put in a great big picture window, and you just sit on your couch and, and watch ice melt. It's, <laughs> it's, it's spectacular. I highly recommend it. That's a view, view out our window. On another trip, and I believe the person who's touching the ice is here tonight, we, we found an iceberg, this is in St. Anthony, that a little piece had broken off. A little piece of an iceberg is called a bergy bit, a bergy bit. 
And the fellow in the blue sweater was a tourist from Germany and he was brave and he took his shoes off and he went out and he brought the little burgie bit um, onto land where we could touch it. Bonnie is there touching 10,000 year old ice, the purest fresh water on this earth. 10,000 year old ice. You are, this is taken through the window one evening. Marvelous. Come in all shapes and sizes. If you get close, all kinds of interesting little details. This photo is taken on the top of Brimstone Head on Fogo Island. Uh, there were a lot of icebergs that year. By the way, last year there were hardly any icebergs. Nobody knows why, but they're back again this year. The Flat Earth people have a lot of history on Fogo Island. And they say that this spot on Brimstone Head is one of the corners of the earth. <laughs> And when you stand there, you don't feel like arguing with them because it <laughs> sort of feels that way. This is the entrance to Fogo Harbor. And if, you have a, if you're on a boat or a ship coming into the harbor, you have to navigate around the icebergs. Tourists come from all over the world to see icebergs in Newfoundland. Again, you can see so the slanted line used to be the water line before it was sitting like this and then it tilts. So you can always see the previous water lines. Well, Newfoundland is not all ice. In the spring and the summer, there are all kinds of wildflowers. These are lupins or lupines, they call them lupins, that grow wild everywhere along the roadside and the gardens. Um, gorgeous, uh, just old fields of lupins. Um, this is taken above the town of Trinity. Um, just gorgeous flowers. Uh, these irises grow wild fields of irises. They call them flags. Um, they grow everywhere in the early summer. This photo was taken on June 24th, 2018. And, and these are crabapple blossoms. Uh, so spring there is about two months later than it is here. Winter is not all that cold. The first year we were there never went below zero. It's just that it's long. It starts early. Sorry. And it lasts, it lasts into May. And it's just long. And so uh, it really isn't until June that you feel like spring has come. If you take a hike in Newfoundland, you might have flowers on either side of you, nice walking paths, uh, hiking trails everywhere, and they're all wonderful. You will never get your feet muddy in Newfoundland hiking, because you're either hiking on rock or you're hiking on uh, a boggy area where it's sort of packed, uh, packed peat, and uh, there's no, no clay, you won't, you won't get dirty. Um, this is the carnivorous pitcher plant. It is the provincial plant of Newfoundland. It grows in bogs. It eats bugs. Um, it holds water and bugs fall down into the water. And if they do try to crawl out, the little hairs on the top of the lip of the plant are aimed down and the bugs can't crawl against them. And so the bugs die and the plant eats them. The sundew plant is also there. It's also carnivorous. It's its little spikes all have glue on the end and then insect lands on that and it can't get away. One of our uh, B and B's uh, with a field of flowers in front of it. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous place. This is above the entrance to St. John's Harbor. Some wild roses, I believe. Sometimes in certain areas of Newfoundland, you look around and say, there are no trees, it's bare. But if you look down, there's a tree. That's a tree, that's a, that's a juniper, but it's a creeping juniper, juniper because the climate is such that it can't grow up, so it does what it can. It just creeps along the ground. In some areas, trees do grow, of course, but you often see flag trees, like the one there on the right, where the prevailing wind is always from the same direction. So on one side of the tree, there are no branches, and all branches are on the other side of the tree. 
so you can tell which way the prevailing wind is. I do not yet have a good moose picture. One of my goals this summer is to get a good moose picture. This is a mother moose with her two babies that we saw on the road one day, but I don't, I'm not really proud of the photograph. So I wanna, I wanna do better. A lot of red foxes, um, very common in a lot of parts of Newfoundland. I, I was waiting for a boat trip one day and I looked over the edge of the wharf down into the water and there were jellyfish. It's the only time I've seen jellyfish and that's a, that's a lion's mane jellyfish, just interesting creatures. On a boat tour to see whales and icebergs, we saw both. This is a humpback whale. Um, so a number of whales that day. This is a humpback whale feeding on capelin. Capelin are a small fish that come to shore every year to spawn. They come by the millions and the humpback whales follow the capelin wherever they go and eat them by huge mouthfuls. That's what this one is doing. Yellow warbler, pine grosbeak eating dandelions. And my favorite place. Newfoundland is my favorite place. This is my favorite place in Newfoundland, Cape St. Mary's. All the little white things you see there are birds. Those are all northern gannets, each with their own little nesting place on the rocks. And you can hike out um, to see them from this vantage point. They are that close. Uh, you hike out to a place where you can sort of look across this little chasm, and there are all the birds nesting. They spend most of their lives at sea, but they spend a number of months on land nesting and raising their young. Um, the ranger here told us that each pair of northern gannets comes back to the same place on the rock every year. I don't know how their reservation system works, <laughs> but that's what he said. Uh, this is the spot. I, if I could go one place and just sit for hours, I would go to this spot right here. At the end of this, like a half mile hike, you sit here and you watch the birds. It's just amazing. And they fly over your head and around you and you're just surrounded with birds. If you look closely, you can see both the parent birds and the young birds. The young birds are uh, white and fuzzy and just a little smaller. The young one, and that's a young one. Um, they're there now, starting to raise their young. The birds wouldn't be that big yet. It's a northern gannet in flight. It's a, just a gorgeous, gorgeous creature. Very large bird coming right at you. This one is bringing some seaweed for the nest. Birds, birds, birds. I don't have a, a video or a movie of this, which I want to do um, when I'm back this time. Gannets are known for their diving. They hover like 100 feet in the air, and when they're a fish, they dive like a rocket into the water. And they do this by the dozens and by the hundreds, and it's quite a spectacular show. You can see a few of them are have their their wings tucked back and they're ready to enter the water and they dive as, as deep as 100 feet under the water as well. But wherever there's a school of fish, you'll see gannets diving. So when you're driving around Newfoundland and you see gannets diving, uh, you might want to stop because there's a school of fish there and there may also be a whale there who's got the same idea. It's usually windy there, often foggy, but we've had good, we've had good luck on Cape St. Mary's. It's just sort of how it feels. Birds flying everywhere. It's a famous Newfoundland folk song called Let Me Fish Off Cape St. Mary's. It's my favorite Newfoundland folk song. It's beautiful. Oops. At Cape St. Mary's, there are other birds as well, but there is a hierarchy. The northern gannets get the best places on the top of the rocks. Lower down, the kittiwakes, that's a 
just look like a seagull, but it's a pinwake. They, they have some nests and the birds with the black backs and the white breasts, uh, those, are, those are called murs. The local people call them turs. Turs are game birds. The local, local men will go out tur hunting with their shotguns and they bring turs home for dinner. Um, so those are, those are turs, but they don't get the best spots. They have to go farther down in the rock. The provincial bird of Newfoundland is the puffin. No puffins on Cape St. Mary's because that's rock. Puffins need to create burrows in which to um, have their young and to protect the young. <coughs> so they have to find an area where there is a ground or this hard packed peat um, for their burrows. Um, a puffin is as big as a football. They're small and they're about that shape. Um, gorgeous. Gorgeous little bird, uh, just fascinating. We've been there when we haven't seen a puffin. And we've been there when we've seen a lot of puffins. Uh, this was our last trip. This friend of mine in the red jacket, he didn't have a very good camera, didn't have a tripod, and he's trying to get a picture of the puffin. See where the red arrow is? That's where the puffins are. So if you want to go photograph puffins, uh, this is at Elliston, which is the best place on land to see puffins. Take the longest lens that you have <laughs> um, and a good tripod. Every, almost every time I've been here, there's, I've seen a perfect, looks like a professional photographer, their big tripod and a lens that long, almost every time, which is sort of what you need. So my friend there is doing, doing the best he can. Those are all puffins. So when you see them, they're there. I always wish that I had a geologist along when I go to Newfoundland because every place you go, now how did that happen? When did that happen? Why did that happen? This is the most important point geologically in Newfoundland. It's called Green Point. It's a World Heritage Site, and it's called the World Geological Benchmark. That's because all of these layers that you see here going vertically were formed at the bottom of the ocean horizontally. And then over a long period of time, we're thrust upward and sticking out of the ground vertically. So the layers that are closest to the camera here are the oldest. And as you walk along the beach, every step you take <clears throat> is thousands of years. It's a fascinating experience. And geologists all over the world use this as a benchmark for identifying layers in, in other places. Great spot. Coastline never lacks for interest. This is the arches along the Great Northern Peninsula on the west part of the island. Uh, it's sort of an imperative tourist stop. Uh, interesting formation. Here's a picture from under the arches out to sea. Interesting place. One day we were there, there were black flies. Yeah, that's the only time I've ever experienced black flies or mosquitoes in Newfoundland. That's the only time, that one day. No. The red mountain in the back of this picture, it's called the Tablelands. This is also an important geological phenomenon. A uh, little town of Woody Point is, is underneath it. Most of Newfoundland is covered with <coughs> either bog or trees. It's all, it's all green, not the tablelands. That's because it's the Earth's mantle thrust up to the surface. And chemically, it is such that nothing grows on it. Um, it, it oxidizes, and that's how it's, it's that rust color. It's basically rust oxidation. Nothing grows on it. You can hike on the tablelands. Uh, NASA brings their Mars equipment here. It's the closest thing we have on Earth to Mars. And um, yeah, it's just absolutely unique. If you have a chance, you want to take the Western Brook Pond boat tour. You only do this by boat. It's like a Norwegian fjord, but it's actually a lake. That's Pissing Mare Falls. <laughs> And I think 
probably appropriately named if you look at it. Uh, just a lovely, lovely, uh, lovely tour. Mm -hmm. Western Brook Pond. More geology. Uh, the dungeons near Bonavista Vista are actually collapsed sea caves, but just sort of fascinating to be there and to look at. This is a mistaken point, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Some of the, the oldest fossils on this earth were found there. And you have to have a ranger lead you there. You can't go there on your own. They limit the groups and they're very careful. They make you wear footies so that when you walk in the rock, you don't damage the fossils. But the fossils are um, 565 million years old, the earliest creatures that we know about on this earth. It was under the ocean, of course, at the time. And this, that flat rock is just covered with these ancient, ancient fossils. Fascinating place. One of the times we were at Mistaken Point, there was a pretty big sea on, and that's probably my favorite photo of the, the waves breaking over the rocks at Mistaken Point. These are thrombolites. You've probably never heard of thrombolites. I hadn't either, but they are fossil remains of ancient bacteria and algae that sort of form clumps. They formed clumps a long time ago. They figure about 650 million years ago. And to get an idea of how big the clumps are, there are some people standing for perspective. Um, just interesting to be able to stand on something where you know how old it is and what it comes from. There are sandy beaches. On Newfoundland, here's one. This is my favorite one. This is on the south coast of Newfoundland near the little town of Bergio. This is Sandbanks Provincial Park, a gorgeous, pristine, wide, sandy beach, hardly anybody else around. Just a lovely, lovely place. Uh, Newfoundland wants to make things easy for the tourists. They know people like to hike. They know people like to climb mountains. So many places they build steps for you. Um, yeah, we went up the other side of this mountain, came down on the steps, which is what I would advise. The other side is, is more of a gradual slope. Um, but imagine building all those steps and they keep them in good condition. Most hiking paths in Newfoundland look like this one, sort of hard packed peat with some roots, um, just sort of spongy as you walk. So it's either rock or that spongy stuff. It's very nice. Beside this one hiking trail, <laughs> they put a bench and they were afraid it would blow away. So they made sure it wouldn't blow away. <laughs> now, this is Cape Spear, the current lighthouse. This is the easternmost point in North America. If you start in New York and go to Ireland, this is a third of the way to Ireland. Have a great circle around. This is the old lighthouse at Cape Spear. Traditionally, the, the lighthouse uh, was always had people there. Usually the lighthouse keeper's family lived there. This is a family home. And the lighthouse keeper had the most important job on the island. To be a lighthouse keeper, was as high a status as you could get because it was so important. And you can tour that uh, lighthouse today and see how the lighthouse family lived. This is the lighthouse on Carpoon Island. We're going to be staying there two nights. That is now a B and B, and it is one of the most isolated places you will ever find. And it's just a fascinating, fascinating place. <laughs> This is the well-known lighthouse at Twillingate, and you can take tours through the lighthouse. You can climb to the top, and there is the light. Actually, that's not the light. That's the glass housing with some prisms that holds the light. The light is about a little bulb, about an inch and a half tall. That's Nola taking a picture. <laughs> This is the lighthouse at Bonavista. Vista. Well, actually both lighthouses, do you see two? The old one is the red and white striped one where the lighthouse family lived. The current lighthouse is that tower with an electric, with a electrically driven light at the top. That's the current lighthouse. It's a wonderful lighthouse to tour. And if you go up to the top of that lighthouse, you'll see the 
the gear mechanism, which keeps the lights turning. Those are the lights at the top. They are oil lamps. So if you're a lighthouse keeper, you have to keep the lamps burning. Let the lower lights be burning too. That's a good um, But yeah, fascinating, fascinating mechanism. Important job. Anybody know what this is? Foghorn. Do not get close to a foghorn when it is horny. <laughs> it will blow you away and ruin your ears. That is loud. 1901 at the Cabot Tower in St. John's. This is at the Capitol. All tourists go to the Cabot Tower. Marconi received the first transatlantic wireless message. He received the letter S from England. First transatlantic message. This is the view from the Cabot Tower in the city of St. John's. An interesting city. I mean, you could spend weeks in St. John's just learning everything about it and going to everything that you can go to there. Interesting town with a perfect harbor, uh, a narrow, narrow, deep entrance, and then this wide, deep harbor. And you can see why it was such an important place for hundreds of years. No vinyl siding is allowed in downtown St. John's. Uh, you have to keep your wooden siding and bright colors are encouraged. Uh, those, those wooden houses are called jelly bean houses. Um, that's how they look. And uh, you, walk around, you just walk around those streets and look at the houses. It's a, it's a fascinating experience. Cemeteries provide photography opportunities. It's my favorite cemetery. If I could be buried somewhere, I'd like to be in this one. It's the St. Peter's Anglican Cemetery in Twillingate. Insides of churches are interesting. This is the inside of the St. Peter's Anglican Church. The very, very high pulpit you can see toward the bottom of the picture. We were, we were at this church one Sunday for services, and the, the preacher did go up to the very, very high pulpit. Interesting experience. Uh, for a photographer, there's no end of opportunities. This is the town of Herring Neck on New World Island, the island we lived on. Herring Neck is just a gorgeous little community. <coughs> on the on Fogo Island, where we're going to spend a couple weeks this summer, they have worked really, really hard to attract people from all over the world to come to Fogo Island. Uh, to, to, to develop the island, to provide jobs for people, to make it a, just a center where people want to go. And one of the things they've done is provide um, special places for artists to work. And these little artist studios, I think there are at least four of them around the island, uh, they have some kind of rotating, rotating system of artists from all over the world who come to this spot to work and to be inspired by the place. So this is one. That's another. Notice the architecture. Everything is on stilts. There's another one. I'd love to be there for a few weeks. It would be a great experience. This is the town of Joe Bat's Arm. A lot of interesting place names in Newfoundland. That'd be another whole subject. Town of Joe Bat's Arm. And on the right side to the top of the photo, you see the famous Fogel Island Inn. Um, the rates are 2,500 to over 5,000 per night. There's a three night minimum. We will not be staying there. <laughs> I have never stayed there. But the 1% from all over the world do stay there. They are always full. People come from everywhere. To stay at the Fogo Island Inn. It's all local food with I mean, the chef prepares, all the blankets are locally made. It is spectacular. And I suppose, by some perspectives, it's worth the money. But yeah, it's an expensive place. The architectural vision behind the Fogo Island Inn and all those artist studios is the humble fishing stage. If you're a farmer, you have a workshop or a shed. If you're a fisherman, you have a stage. That's a stage. And they're always up on stilts, either on the water or beside the water. So when you come in with your boat full of fish, you pull up to the stage, download your fish, you've got the fish, throw the guts in the water, you have your tools, 
in the stage. And that's that's where it happens. It really is like a stage where it, it's a performance. That's the that's it's it's where stuff happens. So there's a fishing stage, they're almost always painted red. This is one on Fogo Island. Um, just everywhere. And again, this is a reminder of how you build in Newfoundland. You don't go down, you've got to go up. That probably doesn't need a whole lot of commentary. <laughs> <laughs> Old and new. CBCs. All Newfoundland gardens are raised then. There are places where you have good soil. And uh, where there is good soil, Newfoundlanders will make gardens and they grow root vegetables, carrots, parsnip, turnip. Uh, they'll grow cabbages, the cool weather crops. The growing season is short, but they grow spectacular big turnips and cabbages. And they're always very, very neat. A lot of root cellars throughout uh, Newfoundland. Uh, lot, most towns, people had root cellars. This photo was taken at Elliston. They call it the root cellar capital of the world. They have a lot of root cellars there, and this, this is one of them. It's a tradition in Newfoundland to hang your wash out to dry. It just, you just see that everywhere. Every, almost every house has a wash line. And as I looked at this photo, I didn't think about it when I took it. I think the person who hung out this wash had some scientific background. Mm -hmm. Don't you think? That's the spectrum. <laughs> That's not accidental. Mm -hmm. they, were, yeah. they were intentional how they did that. At Lonsa Meadows, which is at the very tip of the northern peninsula, it was discovered that there were Viking implements. Viking settlement was there around 1000 AD. That's a long time back. And this is a reconstruction of what they think the Viking houses would look like. Just piles of evidence that the Vikings were there for at least uh, a number of years. And these are houses like the Vikings would have built, um, sort of sod bricks. I want to talk a little bit about this sculpture, which is at Lonsa Meadows, where the Vikings were. A little anthropology here, assuming the anthropologists are correct. Anthropologists say that humanity came out of Africa, and some turned left and went west and filled up Europe. Some turned right and filled up Asia, and eventually crossed the land bridge to North America. And those people filled the Americas, including all the way to Newfoundland. When the Vikings got there, there were indigenous people there. They met them. They called them Spralings, not a complimentary word. But when the Vikings, these European people, met these indigenous people at this spot, that was the first time that those two groups of people had ever met each other. Those that went west into, west into, <laughs> there we go, west into Europe and east into Asia and the Americas, and they met here. And that sculpture celebrates that, that meeting. And there's a lot of little detail in those sculptures that um, I don't have time to go into, but it's really interesting. John Cabot did not discover Newfoundland any more than New and Columbus discovered America. In fact, Columbus never set foot in North America. There's only islands in the Caribbean and Central America. Uh, but John Cabot did land in Bonavista in 1497. His name was Giovanni Caboto. He was actually Italian, but he was sailing for England, so it's called John Cabot. And he came here in 1497. That'd be five years after Columbus made his voyage. You can take a tour through the replica of his ship. I took this picture of flags uh, outside of a restaurant or something somewhere because I think it illustrates uh, sort of Newfoundland loyalties and interests. The top flag is the Canadian flag, which they have to fly on top because they're in Canada. If they had their druthers, they would fly the second flag on top. That's the flag of Newfoundland, uh, but they have to fly that one second. Then comes the British flag. Uh, 
Britain for many, many years had a very strong influence there. And a lot of people have British heritage. Uh, when I taught school, the picture of the Queen was on the wall. But they also had the, the US flag there because they had very good feelings about the United States. They want to attract US tourists. And also during World War II, there were many United States military bases in various places on Newfoundland. And a lot of military men married local Newfoundland women. And the relationship between uh, American servicemen and local people was always very positive. There was even some talk when Newfoundland joined Canada among some people that they wanted to become one of the states of the United States. Uh, the United States was not interested at that point, and so they had to vote whether they wanted to join uh, Canada or try to be independent, which wasn't really viable financially anymore. I want to talk a little bit about the Newfoundland economy yesterday and today. On the upper left, I'm holding our codfish, which I caught. Um, cod made Newfoundland. It was said by the early fishermen who came from Europe to fish there, that they could step out of the boat and walk across the water on the backs of the cod. They were so thick. That's an exaggeration, but not by much. It, it seemed like the supply was inexhaustible until 1992. Overfishing and bad fishing techniques drove the cod stock down to almost nothing. The government placed a moratorium, a complete moratorium on cod fishing, putting thousands of people out of jobs just from one day to the next. It was devastating, but there weren't any cod. Their habitat had been destroyed and they figured in a few years, the cod would come back and everything would be fine. The cod moratorium is still in place today. You can cut fish for cod. There is a little bit of commercial fishing for cod Individuals can go out on certain weekends of the summer and fish for cod. If you go to Newfoundland during the summer and eat at a local restaurant, very likely you can have fresh cod for dinner. But the old cod fishery is gone. Same thing happened in Norway, but in Norway the cod came back. Uh, Newfoundland it hasn't come back yet. Uh, the place of cod has been taken by squid, crab, and shrimp. A lot of crabbing, a lot of shrimping, especially. The lower left is a ship entering St. John's Harbor. The ship was designed to service deep sea oil platforms uh, a couple hundred miles uh, out in the ocean. The largest oil platform in the world is the Hibernia platform, which is off the coast of Newfoundland, and this ship services that. The lower right is a beautiful Victorian house. It's a B and B. We stayed at once. That symbolizes tourism. Tourism is what, what makes Newfoundland go these days. The last two years have been devastating because of COVID. Nobody from outside of Newfoundland has been able to visit. And it was really, really tough. So they are doing everything they can to welcome people back uh, this year. But tourism uh, is really a really big deal. There are bed and breakfasts everywhere. Uh, they, they cater to tourists. They talk standard English for you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it, it's, it's great to be a tourist there. In the upper right is a picture of Alberta. And the yellow area is, there, is the Alberta oil sands. Many, many Newfoundland men are working the Alberta oil sands just to have a job. There's not much employment in Newfoundland unless you're in tourism. And if you want to earn money, you can go to Alberta and earn good money. It's hard work, but they make a lot of money and they stay for several months. They stay for a couple of years, then they come back and they will build a nice new house and buy a nice new pickup truck. You, you walk out some of these Newfoundland villages where there's no industry, nothing going on. And there's a beautiful house and you know, there's an $80,000 pickup truck in the driveway. And this is why the man was in Alberta. It's a big source of income for Newfoundlanders today. I'm assuming, Sam, the, the library has the book The Day the World Came to Town. Does it? Uh, if I, it doesn't, it better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On 9 11, all the, all the planes that were in the air over the Atlantic had to land, and they all landed in Gander. 
Gander is a town of about 13,000, 12 or 13,000 people, smaller than Newton. And the people of Gander and also a bunch of surrounding communities as well hosted the world for days and gave them the traditional Newfoundland hospitality. And people from all over the world were introduced to Newfoundland and were impressed by it. I know of, I know of one town, the town of Lewisport, they kept a, a lot of people there and the, the world travelers, whoever they were in where, whatever country they were from, were so grateful to the people of Lewisport that after they got home, they sent a whole bunch of money to establish a trust fund for the children of Lewisport to be able to go to college. Just to say thank you. That book was made into a Broadway musical. Musical come from away. I haven't been able to see it. I would certainly love to see it if you get a chance. Um, have you seen it? Yeah. Yep. Uh, apparently, it's wonderful. It's based on the book and based on the story. Gander is not that special a town, but it has this special history. Sunset at Cape St. Mary's. I want to tell you something I learned about photography uh, in Newfoundland in these next couple of photos. One evening, I was photographing this really funky sun with the layers of color. Jim, you might remember this. And, you know, I took one picture, then I took another picture. I probably took 80 pictures of this sun. And I thought, well, when the sun goes down, it'll be all over. And I learned a lesson. I, st I stuck around till after the sun went down. And after the sun went down, I had this. This is when the color was after the sun went down. The, the water and the beach were this fantastic color and the sky lit up while the sun was up. There wasn't anything. So hang around after the sun sets. And conversely, in the morning, uh, I was at another location. This is near St. Anthony or in St. Anthony. I got up early one morning because I wanted to get sunrise pictures. I was waiting for the sun to come up. Well, while I'm waiting for the sun to come up, I'll take pictures of the rocks and the sky. And this is what I had. Just this lovely wash of subtle color over everything. I had a tripod, so um, you know, I was able to get a shot like this. And after the sun came up, nothing. It was just the sun and everything else was dead. So stay after the sun goes down and be there before the sun comes up. If you really want to get some nice color. Newfoundland travel tips, uh, real quickly. Do not take a bus tour. Do not take a bus tour. Do not take a bus tour. Mm -hmm. I pity those people. They only go to a few places. They're in a big crowd. You have no flexibility. And they have to stay in hotels. Do not stay in a hotel. There's nothing wrong with Newfoundland hotels, but they're hotels. You can do that here. Stay in a bed and breakfast. Stay in a cabin, vacation rental home. They're great. May to September is a good time to go. Make lodging reservations a year ahead. Don't go this summer. You can't. You can't. There are no places. If you want to go to Newfoundland, go home right now and make reservations for next summer. That's the only way you'll get a place. Um, iceberg finder on your phone tells you where the icebergs are if you want to travel around. Dress in layers, weather can change quickly. High prices and high taxes. Gas in Newfoundland is now more than $2 a liter. And I'm going to be driving a van. So, <clears throat> yeah. But there's a 79% Canada exchange rate right now, so that helps a little bit. Car and van rental prices are astronomical if you can find one at all. Now that might get better in a couple of years, but to rent a van this summer would have cost me $6,500 for two weeks. That's why I'm driving. They have a wonderful distance calculator that you can find on your computer. No longer, no longer facilities anywhere, just be aware of that. Internet is almost everywhere. Make reservations ahead, a boat tour reservations, entertainment reservations, ferry reservations, especially if you're driving, you wanna take the ferry, do that a long time ahead. There are two major airports, St. John's in the east, Deer Lake in the west. You might wanna use both, land at one and take off from the other, uh, so you don't have to, it saves a lot of driving. Uh, don't hit a moose, they're big, the signs, all along the road, how many people have been killed by moose. So you just have to be aware of that. Newfoundland has no snakes. This is good news. There are no snakes anywhere, no skunks, no porcupines, no raccoons, no poison ivy, no poison oak, no ragweed, no ticks, no chiggers, no Lyme disease. 
And that's a pretty ideal place. <laughs> it could be black flies or mosquitoes, but I've never hardly ever had trouble with them. And either take one very versatile camera or your full load of camera equipment. And I want to show you a couple of things when I'm done here about my camera. Um, this beautiful B&B we stay at, don't stay at a hotel. You get this personal service at the B&Bs and get to know the, the local lady or man who's running it. This is a B&B hostess entertaining us after dinner with a performance on the ugly stick. That's a Newfoundland uh, rhythm instrument. Everybody plays the ugly stick and, and it's fun to, to make the ugly stick look funny and it sounds good. Some of us will remember this performance. There's a deck by the water by our favorite B&B. Those are all icebergs uh, steaming in the evening sun. I want to show you a couple of cameras. The last several trips, most of the photos that you saw are this camera. This is a Canon 7D. And you either want a versatile camera or a trunk load of lenses, one or the other. And I don't want a trunk load of lenses. So I take a versatile camera. This is an 18 to 300 Sigma zoom. 18 is really wide angle, 300. That's where I got those puffin pictures and the, and the Gannett pictures. So you need something like that, unless you want to carry around a lot. But this year, even though that's a better camera, I'm taking this little fella. This is, this is a point and shoot. This is a Canon, uh, let's see, what's it called? PowerShot SX70HS, 20 megapixels. The lens goes from 21 to 1,365. And since this is a crop sensor lens, that's equivalent to 35 to 1,900. Imagine having a 1,900 millimeter lens that only weighs a pound and a half. This weighs three and a half pounds. Which would you rather carry around? And I have gotten excellent shots in bright daylight. Don't use this in low light, it doesn't work very well. But in bright daylight, I've got excellent shots at 1,900 millimeters handheld. This good image stabilization. It's just a dream. The image quality isn't quite as good as the better cameras, but you'll get the shot. You can do macro within a couple of inches, wide angle, zoom, Forever. That's optical zoom. That's not the fake digital zoom. This is real uh, 60, 65 times optical zoom. So either take a boatload of equipment or something that's versatile. Questions? I'm done. Yes, thank you. Questions? How much for BNB? How much for a BNB? The cheaper ones are probably, and this is Canadian funds, are $80, $90 a night. The more expensive ones are upward of 200, depends. Um, but I always subtract 21% US funds. Are you driving up there? We are driving. How long? Long way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one mm -hmm. uh, I, I bought a van and I'm going to sell it back to the dealer when I get back. And with the current market for used cars, they say I'll, I should lose more than a thousand dollars, which is a lot better than 6,500. Yeah. Other questions? And those of you watching on Zoom or Facebook, you can type your questions and I'll um, give them to, to Weldon. I have never been screeched in. But Randy, I know you've been screeched in. What's involved in being screeched in? That makes you a real Newfoundlander. You have to kiss the cod. Um, and I both. Both been screeched in. You you have to kiss a cod, and then you drink some screech. It's the local brew. Yeah, and have to say some words or something. Yeah, yeah. Some kind of word yeah. And it makes you a certificate. You got a certificate. It's a real Newfoundlander. I haven't done that yet. I should. Your son has. Hmm? Your son has. Uh, yeah, probably has. 
Is the water clear? It looks like it's pretty clear. The water is usually very clear. Yeah. But cold. You don't go to Newfoundland to swim. <laughs> very cold. Very cold. Even though there are sandy beaches, it's not, not a swimming place. And the stories of Newfoundland hospitality are true. They are instinctively hospitable. Just, just the way it is. They'll treat you fine. And you said you've had opportunities to meet up with your former students that still live in that area? Uh, one time I walked in a local grocery store and there was one and mm -hmm. Facebook friends with several. And yeah, it's, it's sort of fun to see what, what happens to former students. As Janet could attest. <laughs> well, other questions? I hope I've given you a a bug to travel there, but plan for next year, not this year. Yes. So, what's uh, industry fishing? Is there other things there? How does it there used to be a lot of lumbering, a lot of mining. The pulp and paper industry used to be huge. That's all shut down now. Um, tourism, service industries, um, not much manufacturing. A couple little spots of farming. There are dairy farms. Um, Tourism, oil. You've read Farley Moore's book about cruising the southern shore. Yes, I have. If you see any books by Farley Mowat, uh, he's a Canadian author. He writes a lot of books about Newfoundland, and they're delightful. If you want to get the flavor of the place, Farley Mowat is a good one. This rock okay. within the sea. This rock within the sea. I have the book. Yes. And you've read the book. What? The boat who didn't float. I've read the boat who didn't float. Yes. I was reading it. I had to step out, out loud to order mm -hmm. when we were driving. Yeah. I had to quit. We were laughing so hard. You were laughing. To see to read <laughs> or to, to watch the road. You can buy thick books called Newfoundland Dictionary so that you can understand the, the locals. Uh, you go, go, on, you, go on YouTube and look up Newfoundland talk. It's 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 a hoot. A lot of fun. Oh, yes. Did you ever see the taxi at uh, Port of Bass that had its phone number on the side? No. Well, they had the you know the whole front end of the numbers, but the last four digits were pictures of trees. Oh, <laughs> tree hundred and thirty tree. Yeah. <laughs> tree, 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 yeah, <laughs> to a Newfoundlander that communicates perfectly, well, uh, tree, 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 yeah. my wife got in an argument with the first grader, you know, they don't have the word my, and so one day the little first grader told Florence, I want some pencil, and she said, no, my pencil. And she said, no, me pencil. <laughs> and they went back and forth. My wife is trying to correct the grammar and the child thought she was trying to claim the pencil for herself. <laughs> interesting, interesting argument. Well, um, I am willing, I, this, the tour I'm doing this summer is with my wife's siblings and their spouses. There are going to be seven of us. I've organized these tours a number of times. This is going to be the last tour I organized. But if anybody wants any advice or wants a copy of my itineraries, I'd be glad to share them. Anybody who wants to go, I'll share anything that I have with you. I'd like you to encourage you to go, except that I'm, I'm not going to take you. <laughs> Sorry. I wouldn't mind meeting you there. Yeah. So, thank you. Thanks. And